I'm here today to give you, make a political point. And the political point is simply this, that if we want to avoid the structural alignment that sends AI and medicine to a very bad place, we're going to have to flip the clinic. And I'll explain what that means. And so this flipping the clinic is not a nice to have, a cute to have, it's a necessity if in fact artificial intelligence is going to become a part of uh, medicine. So here's a child. You don't have to imagine a child. This is a child who was doing fine until age four and starting age five and six, started losing milestones and finally was no longer speaking, no longer walking. Multiple doctors were visited and with no uh, recourse. And finally, this patient's family made their way to the Undiagnosed Disease Network, a network of 12 academic health centers that I happen to be uh, the principal investigator of the coordinating center here at Harvard Medical School. And the patient, this boy, was seen. All the mutations that they had were filtered using a narrow AI algorithm. And experts were brought to bear who understood about his symptoms. And they found that he had a deficiency in one particular gene, GTP cyclohydrolase 1, which is a necessary step to making neurotransmitters. And so with that knowledge, they gave this child a cocktail of neurotransmitters, and lo and behold, within a few weeks, this child started walking and talking. And we've seen this happen several times. We've seen over 2,000, 3,000 uh, patients have made new diagnoses for, true novel diagnosis for over 500 of them. But the point I want to make here is what's important about here about this story? A, the data went with the patient. B, the decision support, the AI went with the data which went with the patient. Third, the patient went wherever they needed to go. They were not stuck in one hospital. They could go anywhere in this undiagnosed disease network across the United States. Keep that in mind. I had the, the startling experience of getting a call in October of 2022 from Peter Lee, vice pre corporate vice president at Microsoft, who wanted to share with me something that was very secret that back then. This was before ChatGPT. It was about GPT-4, and he showed me what it could do. And I've been in sort of cognitive thrashing ever since then. Because on the one hand, I know as computer scientist that at its basis, at its lowest level of ab abstraction, it's just predicting the next word. But at the same time, in terms of performance, as I wrote up in this book that I co-wrote with uh, Peter Lee and um, uh, Gary Goldberg, this program was able to diagnose a patient that we had not diagnosed at the Undiagnosed Disease Network because they had atypical symptoms. And this program, GPT-4, figured out which one of the genes that were mutated were responsible for this one in a million diagnosis. So it's a little bit mind-blowing that we have this program with these general capabilities that's not specialized in medicine, it's not fine-tuned for medicine, and it's able to perform at this level. And it makes lots of mistakes, and it has hallucinations. And yet, it provides this performance. And there's a lot to be said how it could and will play medicine, and that's in the book, but that's not what I am here to tell you about today. First, you've heard a lot about it, and I just want to pile on about the misalignment in healthcare, the misalignment between the way clinicians like myself are trained and the expectations of patients and the misalignment between incentives of the overall system and those other 
three parties. This misalignment results in, for example, importantly, primary care is hollowed out. When I have, I'm a department chair at Harvard, and when I have a new faculty member come, and I try to find them primary care, I cannot find any pr open quality primary care practice unless you're willing to pay for a concierge practice. Primary care is hol hollowed out, and um, at the national level, we're missing tens of thousands of primary care doctors. Second is, we're fundamentally still a fee-for-service system. The more you do to the patient, the more you get paid. Therefore, we do things to you. <laughs> and so that may not always be the best thing. And that creates all sorts of distortions and means that certain specialties get paid a lot of money to do things for you, to you unnecessarily. Also, we're being asked to see patients really, really fast. Why? So we can see a lot of patients. Why? So we can get a lot of reimbursement, which means all our time with patients are being, squ are being squeezed down. You have questions? I don't know. Too bad. Tell me about it later. <laughs> Medicine's getting very complex and more to be known, and yet knowledge diffusion is going down. Talk to most primary care doctors. They don't know anything about genomics, for example. They will misdiagnose many people. That's why we have so many undiagnosed, hundreds of thousands of undiagnosed patients in the United States. And all this leads to burnout with doctors leaving at unprecedented rates uh, because of the administrative and uh, pressures, the time pressures, and trade-offs they have to make. And there's also data set shift problems. For those of you who are in the machine learning community, because data is siloed across multiple hospitals, never unified for a number of very parochial, greedy reasons, the training of these AIs always is on a few hospitals, which means it doesn't tr translate well. It does not transfer well, which creates a huge problem for the FDA which again, we talk about in the book and I will not talk about here. What's gonna happen if we don't keep an eye on ball? I'm gonna argue that the following things we have to worry about, among the things we have to worry about, if we don't keep our eye on the ball and have a public discussion now. One, and we need to be inspired by the reversal of telehealth. Everybody was cheering how great telehealth was, and it was great. You know, a parent with a kid with a behavioral disorder would not have to go back to uh, the hospital for multiple checkup visits. They could do it by Zoom. But now, guess what? Everybody has to go back to the hospital. Why? Because now the insurance companies, where the heat is off, understandably are saying, we're not going to pay you as much for an in-hospital visit as for a Zoom visit. So now the hospital say, you better come in because otherwise we're not going to get full freight. So that's what's going to happen to all of AI if we don't watch it. Also, it could well be People saying, oh, don't let patients, the patients don't know what they're doing. Don't, and they'll say, it's, maybe it's only for doctors. Only doctors can look at it. I'm hoping that the cat is out of the bag and enough, and it is the case, that millions of patients are already using these large language models. But there could be a backlash, and I've seen some legislation, proposed legislation, which would limit it. Also, if we go with our current system, these large language models will still be providing advice for patients with data siloed in different hospital systems. So you'll keep getting repeated tests, repeated questions, repeatedly billed for the same things. I can tell you on an undiagnosed disease network, you know, you have one genome, but I've seen patients come in with three genomes sequenced, and it's just because they could, because someone's getting paid. Right now, mercifully, when you go into these large language models, and then the chatbots, there's no advertisement. How long will that last? And if we let it come in, how will it affect the prompts and the context? What's going to happen? Other people already have a lot of our medical data. What if they also have the decisions made on the medical data? Who's going to use that IP? How will that IP be used for patients? And certainly, there's a lot of money to be made in making administrative processes more efficient. Do you really think medicine become cheaper because people are going to save money on the administrative processes? No. <laughs> You're very naive of you. And in electronic health records, we were promised this would be used to improve care. Electronic health records have been used to improve billing, not care. Will AI be used this way? If we don't keep our eye on the ball, 
That's what's going to happen. And who, and the pe people like myself, I've written the articles about how maybe we can bring doctors back because they won't have to do all these administrative tasks. But who's going to stop a company saying, you know, this chatbot's doing pretty well. Why do we need to have uh, that many doctors at all? So maybe it'll reduce our access to doctors. A very, very possible event. So I'm going to argue instead that there is a bright future. And it's a bright future that's enabled by, by AI to get around the misalignment that I showed currently exists and the gross misalignment that will happen if we don't keep our eye on the ball. But it centers on flipping the clinic. That means that wherever you are, and what flipping clinic means is wherever you are, the data follows you, the AI follows your data, and you control who gets access to your data. And this is not a pipe dream. In the 21st Century Cures Act, passed by Congress several years ago, there was a stipulation that patients get access to electronic, computable forms of their record from hospitals. And in fact, we wrote a API specification and implemented it called Smart on Fire that's now used widely, in, for example, in your, in your iPhone for Apple Health. And it works with now with over um, 805 uh, hospitals. But we have to stipulate now that patients are the primary controllers. And I'm not asking your grandmother to, to be giving role-based access to different providers. I want them to have the legal right to, to delegate and say, these are the conditions under which my data can be used. So that as a class, patients can say, this model, AI model, can actually be updated with our information. The underlying pre-trained model can be now updated, or perhaps the context, if you're one of the more in-context learning uh, fans, whether it's the context or the pre-trained model, can be updated in a way that allows us to respond to new things happening in our healthcare system, unlike what happened in COVID. And if we start looking at patients as part of a group of similar patients, we're going to be able to address the data set shift issues that shut down programs, AI programs that were deployed in COVID because although it was trained to predict mor uh, mortality in one hospital, just a few hospitals away with a different patient case mix, the, mor the mortality predictor did not work. And so this will allow us to actually take that step forward and make sure that we learn as a learning health system with AI doing the learning across all the different subsets of patients that are relevant. And if we do so, we will be able to improve patient outcomes. We will be able to advance science, but only if we flip the clinic. And that means that there are going to be novel organizations and it's not clear to me whether it's going to be governmentally sponsored or nonprofits that serve the patient such that they're guaranteed um, that, in fact, the clinic has been flipped. And whether you're at home, whether you're working, whether you're exercising, whether you're in 99% of, uh, of the time that you're not in the hospital, the clinic is going to be with you. And I will st stop there. And before you give me any applause, I'm going to try a little uh, political action here. I'm going to ask you to repeat after me, and we're going to try it until you get it right. I want it loud. We're going to repeat after me. Make our data work for us. Get it? Start. Make our data work for us. Louder. Make our data work for us. That's it. Thank you very much.